Good morning to everybody and uh, many thanks to the organizers for this uh, generous invitation and hospitality. Um, nearly 14 years have passed since 9-11 triggered off the adoption at IMO of two main international instruments aimed at counteracting crimes at sea. And not only terrorism, but crimes at sea in general. And um, the purpose of my talk today is to revisit the rationale behind those instruments in the light of the ever-increasing complexities of security at sea. And not everybody of you needs to be familiar with those instruments, so I'm going to mention them in my, in this, in my second slide, which is, uh, is the SOLAS Convention, the main IMO Convention on Safety, uh, as a result of 9-11, include a new chapter, 11Bs, um, on international, uh, 11 bits on security. And this chapter is related to a, a code, uh, uh, the ISPS code, uh, which is the International Ship and Port Security Codes, regulating preventive measures on board ships and in port. So the regulation of the ship port interface in matter of security. Then the uh, IMO started the preparation and afterwards adopted uh, in 2005 amendments to the 1988 SUA Treaty, which is on the suppression of unlawful acts against uh, ships and off against ships and, and also with, has a protocol related to offshore platforms in the continental shelf. Um, so while the SOLAS did with prevention, uh, the 2000 amendments, so the SUA Convention, leads, uh, deals with prosecution and extraditions on crimes at sea. But let me evoke first how we lived 9-11 at IMO. Uh, I, I, I was at a meeting of directors when the secretary came to announce that one of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center had been hit by an aircraft. So we were naturally shocked, but we went on with the meeting until the same secretary came to say that the second tower had been hit. So we then adjourned and uh, came back to our offices only to find everybody bewildered. Uh, the guidelines not to switch on the internet during working hours were totally disregarded so that you saw in every screen the, uh, the images of, of people jumping to their death. And, uh, and then immediately came uh, the news that the Pentagon had been hit. The IAMO staff was, uh, is international and too many people and, uh, have families and, and, um, and, and friends and relatives in the United States. Uh, who were trying to get in touch with. Uh, and then everybody was asking what will come next. Uh, the morning after, so that on, uh, uh, on the 12th of September, uh, five of us met with the Secretary General uh, of IMO to address the consequences of 9-11 for the organization. Uh, we started by considering how incidents similar to 9-11 could take place in the maritime field. Namely, we address hypothetical scenarios of ships being used as weapons against port or port installations. Um, nevertheless, we were aware that such casuistic approach was not enough. So my note for the file documenting uh, this first meeting on 12 September 2001, state is that, I'm going to quote I'm going, uh, part of it, state is that it, at the meeting there was agreement that anti-terrorist measures should be addressed within the scope of general safety measures uh, rather than being pinpointed exclusively to combat terrorism. Lessons to be learned from 11.9, as we said in, 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 in Europe, in, from 11.9-2001, should be integrated within a context of a general holistic approach to safety within port ships interface. And uh, 
this is what uh, what IMO precisely did. Uh, the holistic approach uh, envisaged by the IMO secretariat already on the day after the attacks um, relies on uh, on on a couple of, of, uh, of, of, of some important principles. First, uh, not only uh, prevention of crimes, that just to which would, uh, the rules on prevention of crimes would be included in the, in the solace, uh, but also punishment of criminals, namely the amendments to the, uh, to the SUA Convention on Suppression of Unlawful Acts. But then another thing that people tend to forget sometimes, not only terrorism, but crimes at sea. Crimes at sea are interrelated. So when you talk about terrorism, piracy, or things like that, I mean, people are missing the point. I mean, everything is sort of integrated. So criminal figures and criminal organizations are, are, are much more complex. So it's very difficult to separate one thing with the other, from the others. So that was at least the approach that IAMO took in order to adopt general uh, security provisions. But now we were going from safety to security. Yeah? Uh, and uh, at the meeting, uh, we still, you could see in, in, my, in my notes, we still refer to safety. Instead, instead, the amendments to SOLAS, as well as the ISPS code, refer to security. This means that, although conceived within a nation, with an emotion with, within a general framework of safety at sea, security means something very distinctive. It concerns the safety risk posed by it in in intentional criminal action. Um, while safety addresses accidental risks, security deals with risk arising out of criminal intentions to cause damage on persons of goods. As indicated in the quotation of my notes above referred, from the very beginning, IMO aimed at issued measures aimed at preventing all kinds of crimes and not only terrorism. I'm going to refer to the ISPS security code to make some comments of how we were then and how we stand now. I mean, by the way, you have some samples of the ISPS security code behind and then also, I mean, of the SOLAS Treaty and the, uh, the SUA Treaty, so all the instruments I'm referring now. Um, the ISPS code. Yeah. Um, in, in May 2004, I gave in Bremen a public lecture on the then imminent entry into force of the ISPS code. Um, I then focused on the profound impacts brought by the code to the maritime industry. So nothing would be the same after the inclusions, after the inclusions in SOLAS and a, a, a sort of a, a safety treaty of crime prevention of provisions. So this certainly exceeds the scope of, of, of everything, really. The SOLAS was conceived to prevent accidents, and now we had to put crime prevention provisions. And so that, uh, so that caused, I mean, uh, SOLAS was a treaty that was uh, a, uh, insurance only seaworthiness by preventing accidents. And so then the amendments to SOLAS uh, meant the expansion of its scope to include not only, first, not only technical regulations applicable on, on board ships, but also uh, the, um, the expansion of the scope to regulate port activities. So you had the maritime treaty in particular restricted to, the, uh, to ships now governing the ship interface the, so that's, the, the shipments are expanding. This might and treaty to regulate port security, uh, security measures in port. And uh, nobody liked it in Bremen. I remember the industry, the, the representatives, <laughs> academics uh, the, of the ports. In, uh, they hated it, actually, just to see. And then there were some uh, very interesting things that was the, not only these extensions to, uh, to ports, but also the interference in the maritime business of an unfamiliar class of people. 
namely the, the security officers. So you would not have only the masters and the crew, etc., but some people coming from the security industries. You know, people don't like security in general, really. they feel that they are a little alien. And then they were going to be on board ships, you had to have a security officer on board ships, you have to have security offers in port, uh, and also in shipping companies. So all this sort of interfering with the normal business of merchant marine, I mean, with the normal activities of ports and, uh, and um, uh, of, of ships and ports in the exercise of international trade. Uh, well, during the question and answer period at the conference in Bremen, um, it, um, um, as I say, all kind of mentions were, were, were voiced. I remember that there seemed to be in that moment a lack of consensus regarding the role of the federal state, the individual states and the local port authorities. Um, I'm sure that those problems have been solved or, or perhaps not. And, uh, but I have to say that um, in response to these apprehensions, I noted that the main justification of the ISPS code was that it provides an alternative of legal certainty at an international level. So we came to the usual plea from, from, from I am more to the world to say sorry, unless you, unless we adopt global measures, everybody will take unilateral measures. In that moment, uh, in particular the United States, obviously, but other countries also were considering to uh, take unilateral actions, to have their own provisions. And, uh, and based on the principle of, um, uh, uh, yes, they were using the principles, the right of self-defense. Say, so sorry, everybody has a right to exercise self-defense. Self -defense, so we intend just to, to have our own regulations unless global regulations are adopted at IMO. Well, the uncertainties on the ISPS code, I mean, no, no legal instrument provides, gives you uh, all the certainty you are asking for, because life is uncertain and uh, security and all those issues are really, are really the same. Yeah? So, I mean, uncertainties still exist, still will exist, so that means that the ISPS code is kept under continuous reviews, continuous review. And, uh, and there are uncertainties at present. I mean, the discussion held last week and this week at the, uh, the IMO uh, Merit and Safety Committee reflects a degree of anxiety regarding uh, the way the ISPS code is implemented in the face of the ever-increasing risk posed by a world in turmoil, or I would say a maritime world in turmoil. Uh, a working group has been considered, some uh, a set of guidelines and the, the name of guidelines for the development of maritime security legislation. And these guidelines should update the implementation requirements against the background of increasing criminality at sea. Um, the, um, there is always a question, I just put it at the very end, on, on screening of personnel and seafarers on short leave. That concerns, uh, is a very difficult question because uh, not everybody entering a, uh, entering a ship or entering port should be screened in accordance with the, uh, with, with the ISPS code. But only people who are vital or have a, a vital function or are suspected of or whatever, really. So I could see that the debate this the last week at IMO was in the sense that they wanted to, uh, some delegations wanted to uh, to, uh, to introduce the idea of compulsory screening for everybody and, uh, and obviously the industry was bewildered against it and, um, and then also we have the problem of seafarers on short leave that uh, in particular the United States has tried to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to regulate additional measures, measures additional so that uh, seafarers in, when they go to the United States should comply with additional requirements to, uh, to, to this uh, to short leave while the ship is in port. 
and um, this has been attacked by many countries and also by, by, by some by the International Labour Organization. Um, so, uh, but then we are coming to a, a very difficult question now, the, one, the question of the cyber risks. It has been found that when the code was adopted many years ago, uh, it didn't take into account the, uh, uh, this, uh, the risk that would be brought by the, by the increased use of electronic data. And, um, and, and this is obviously, we see that the cyber risk have increased dramatically in the last years uh, in variety, uh, frequency and sophistication. So the threat to computer system comes now from different forms. Today we have some of the most common threats consist of software attacks, thefts of intellectual property, thefts of equipment and information, sabotage and extortion to steal money, etc. And the... Um, maybe it's a bit, you know, yeah, still in cyber risk. Uh, in the, uh, so then, I mean, if you have viruses, worms and Trojan horses are really one of the few examples of software attacks. So the ISPS code makes reference to the security of computer systems and networks. However, some provisions adopted in 2001 and 2001 yep, seems to be a little narrow. For instance, the code makes reference to radio and communication systems, including computer systems and networks. So as written, it may suggest that computer systems as a network are a subtype of communication systems. Uh, and this could lead to an interpretation that only computer systems um, uh, and networks supporting communications uh, are of importance when conducting security assessments. So if you, if you only uh, pick up computer systems and networks supporting communications, you are, ex you are likely to exclude other important types of cyber systems, which are not necessarily supporting communications. For instance, several navigation systems, supervisory control and data acquisition systems, security systems uh, and corporate human resources, and financial systems. Now let's move to the SUA, to amendments to the, to the SUA Convention. Um, the SUA Convention uh, is a comprehensive treaty that typifies all sorts of crimes at sea and establishes jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of parties either to extradite or to offenders or to punish them. The SUA uh, is waterproofed in the sense that it sure that nobody escapes due process and punishment, either prosecute or extradite the alleged, the, the alleged offender. But on no account let any alleged offender uh, escape uh, due to lack of adequate provisions. This was the basic idea behind the original 1988 SUA Treaty, which was adopted uh, as um, to prevent the procedural frauds that enabled the terrorist who seized the Achille Lauro in 1985 to escape unpunished. So I am all decided that we need new amendments to, to take into account other type of crimes. For instance, I mean, we have, to, we have offenders who, are, uh, who commit suicide, so then you have to be sure that you include the participations of the people who help them and, um, and many other different types of crimes. So the list of crimes was also enlarged um, and then the um, and, and then some procedural strips, uh, some um, procedural steps were uh, also better elaborated. Um, then there are some things that you read together uh, that is a very important thing for, for people doing research, really, that you have to read together some SUA provisions with the ISPS code. For instance, the ISPS code provides that uh, uh, ships and ports have to be uh, to, to, to set some security levels. So have to communicate and set security levels which can go from, from, uh, from security levels from more relaxed to more stringent uh, requirements. 
And so before the ships arrive on port, they have to communicate each other under which security level are. Uh, so the ship finds a corresponding uh, I mean, <coughs> answer in the port. Well, just imagine if you are a ship who, who brings uh, alleged offenders detained because they have been caught committing a crime, and then you have to deliver it in port. So the port has to be prepared uh, to accept this delivery, and flag state and port authority should not be uncertain today about which responsibilities are. That happens all continuously, really, in cases when you have uh, criminals at sea that, uh, that, that port tends to refuse uh, delivery, and, uh, and then the, the master has to keep the alleged offender on board the ships, etc. I mean, a very complicated uh, issue. And then if you read together the IAMO instruments, I repeat, they are not separate instruments in practice, they have to, read, to be read together, uh, then you have solutions and legal certainty in connection with detention of offenders, transference uh, for port authorities to keep in custody while awaiting due process, which would lead to either punishment or extraditions. Now, the delegates attending the SUA diplomatic conference uh, in 2005, so the, the conference where these um, amendments were adopted, they overstepped each other in, in fire proclamations in the sense that uh, the new treaty would send a clear measures of, uh, to terrorists all over the world. Uh, However, uh, ten years later, I'm not sure how terrorists or criminals have uh, taken this message because, I mean, in fact, the, 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 uh, the amount of, of ratifications and exceptions to the new SUA treaty is distressingly poor. Uh, when you had the delegates, you, you felt in that moment as if they were to immediately to ratify it, but not so. And um, it looks as if there was no real will uh, coming from the international community to become party to those uh, 2005 SUA amendments. We only have 34 countries uh, against 153 countries, um, in, um, and I guess 123 countries, 153 countries in the old treaty. Well, uh, no news from Germany yet. And uh, more astonishingly, no news from the USA, which relentlessly pushed for so many innovative uh, provisions, including some extraordinary novel regulations, uh, according to which ships can, under certain conditions, board uh, in the high seas other ships suspected of being engaged in terrorist acts. Uh, and this, this is a pity, because um, during the travel preparators, preparators, many delegations explained reservations vis-à-vis -vis uh, those boarding provisions that uh, the USA was so keen to include in the treaty. And this may be one of the reasons, although not the only one, uh, why countries, uh, in my view, uh, are reluctant to, uh, to, uh, to implement SUA. So, I mean, they have lots of, lots of uh, considerations on how do those boarding provisions relate to, to, the, uh, to UNCLOS or not, etc. Uh, but, uh, and in fact, under the circumstances, the SUA provisions should be uh, complementing the UNCLOS provisions on piracies. You see that uh, UNCLOS, uh, according to UNCLOS, uh, ships of any, uh, uh, governmental ships of any, uh, of any country can detain in the high seas uh, a, a, a pirate ship, or ships where pirate action, pirate activities are being taken place. So there is a universal jurisdiction. Anybody can detain the pirate ships. Well, the idea behind, uh, the, behind the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the SUA was that anybody should be able to, 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 to intercept a ship in the high seas uh, when they were found committing crimes other than piracy. Um, although that, that SUA is more restricted. So in the case of the SUA treaty, uh, 
you didn't have a pirate ship uh, to be bored, but you have a ship just suspected of uh, being engaged or being uh, involved in the commission of offenses other than piracy. So the ship, the pirate ship, normally loses its its uh, flight, its flag, uh, but not so other ships, which may still keep the flag and be suspicious of being involved in commission of of, uh, of crimes. Uh, so, so then what the SUA does, they, they have a very, very long article on this, that is a treaty within a treaty, those SUA amendments, in which they talk very, very uh, clearly about how to a ship could intercept a ship of another uh, flag and eventually board it. This interception and this boarding have to be taken place after consultation with the flag state. And, uh, and I mean, a lot of procedural uh, issues have to be considered, really. And, um, well, uh, I'm going to conclude now, really. I think that because I have only four, four, five minutes left. Um, but I have to say, well, look, what, what is the meaning of all this, isn't it? Uh, I would say that if, if 14 years later, after I am a swift reaction to 9-11, uh, criminal activities seem have proliferated in unexpected ways. So, for instance, for instance we, we were always expecting the, the scenario uh, like the Armageddon, something similar to 9-11. The, to the, to yeah? So what would it be? Would it be that a cruise ship, those mega cruise ships, are taken over by terrorists. But terrorists who, well, started to, to, to commit people, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to kill people before committing suicide, before blowing the ship, and that, then the ship could be used as, as going against a port installation. Well, all those scenarios, in fact, nothing of this happened. Yeah? Uh, so uh, the catastrophic approach, I mean, uh, it didn't happen. Although we are, if you speak with anybody, uh, with any IMO Secretary General, when, uh, when I've been attending, when they speak to ministers in different countries, they always, the Secretary General of IMO, they will boast the apprehension that one day we could have a serious a terrorist incident in, uh, in a cruise ship. And, but it hasn't happened. But on the contrary, crimes at sea uh, have multiplied in different shapes and forms. And this is in particular nowadays due to near war situations, uh, consistent really which result in the erosions of coastal and port state jurisdiction. Just think of areas of, such as the Gulf of Aden, West Africa, and more recently the Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, the Andaman Sea, etc. It seems that we are coming to, and then obviously uh, we are sending navies to cope with this. You see, I mean, it's an enormous state of affairs. I mean, there would not be a role for navies, yes. And then we have to have armed personnel in on board uh, on board merchant ships which was something that unthinkable in 2001 and um, uh, and so then uh, the world has changed maybe uh, and then the crimes at sea have become uh, have, uh, the, the the evolution of the menace of crimes at sea has has been re rather different that uh, what we thought on, on 9-11 or on the day after. Uh, but, and so that validates more the, the IMO holistic view. Not only terrorism, but any sort of crimes at sea. States have just to, I think it's my conclusions here, states have, states have to, uh, to apply these uh, this, um, provisions in a coherent and consistent way. Uh, and it is very important that, uh, that, uh, that IMO security measures are properly implemented through efficient general uh, coordination and cooperation. So that's the problem we are forcing now. I mean, you have merchant shipping that they try to be as, I mean, uh, they are using ship security officers, they, they are accepting uh, uh, pers armed personnel on board, etc., etc. So the world is, it won't be ne never the same. But, but the real security menace comes as of the, the breaks to peace and security 
uh, in, uh, in, in different regions of the world. And obviously, in connection with, uh, with the maritime world, we talk about the, the, the breach of peace and security in uh, coastal states, in ports, things of the Libyan ports nowadays, etc. So I end saying that, as uh, the uh, politician says, uh, or the Secretary General of IAMO always says, uh, well, nothing will be solved unless we have our, uh, we have peace on earth, peace and security on earth. So, uh, first come patching in, in Terrace and then it follows patching in Maribus. Thank you very much.